Hello, thank you for joining us. I appreciate all the curious minds, truth seekers, and history buffs, and random people who like to watch random YouTube videos for jumping on and uh, and watching this video. Put some time into it, some effort into it, and I hope you enjoy. Today we're setting sail on the choppy waters of history to explore a little architectural marvel that's probably a little bit older than your grandma's collection of unpronounceable spices. Our journey takes us back to a time when people thought the earth was a pancake or a pizza or something else flat. But they weren't completely dim. They did manage to build some things like this big candle holder looking structure. The Lighthouse of Alexandra, the ancient version of Google Maps, but with more fog and less buffering. So why should we care about this massive torch on steroids, you ask? Well, strap yourself to your seat like a sailor in a bad storm because we're diving into the history, engineering brilliance, and cultural pizzazz of the Lighthouse of Alexandra. Now let's set the stage, shall we? We're zooming into ancient Alexandra, not to be confused with the more modern one with, you know, less togas and a lot more traffic. Founded by this guy named Alexander the Great, don't know, maybe you've heard of him. Uh, he was a conqueror who had a penchant for naming cities after himself that he founded. Uh, sometimes he came across a city that already existed and said, nope, your name is now Alexandria. He ran out of ideas, I think. But anyway, this Alexandria was like the cool kid on the Mediterranean block, strategically placed at the crossroads of Egypt, Europe, Asia, and the Arabian Peninsula, like prime real estate for uh, the ancient civilizations. When he died, the empire that he had created... Uh, was split up into different dynasties. It was parceled out. And in the Egyptian area of his empire, we're looking at a dynasty that we call the Ptolemaic dynasty. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Really don't care. Now, Ptolemy Philadelphus, also known as Ptolemy II, bit of a mouthful, I know. He took over the family business after his dad, Ptolemy I, also known as Ptolemy Soter, decided he'd rather be pushing daisies than leading his empire. Ptolemy II wasn't just good at inheriting, he also had a thing for making Alexandria the Beyonce of ancient cities. So picture this, a melting pot of cultures, ideas, and more languages than the Tower of Babel potluck dinner would have. This was the Hellenistic period, where everyone wanted a slice of the Greek pie, or should I say baklava. Now, Alexandria wasn't just a city, it was a buzzing hive of scholars, artists, and thinkers. It had the first ever public library, and instead of Wikipedia with all those infuriating edit wars, they forced everyone to hand over their scrolls when entering the city so they could make copies. If there were any editing wars, no one could tell, as they didn't really do citations back then. But this wasn't about the Library of Alexandria, it's about the lighthouse. I just wanted to talk about books real quick. Ships sailing into Alexandria's bustling port needed a guiding light, quite literally. The lighthouse wasn't just a flamboyant piece of architecture, it was a maritime necessity preventing ships from becoming unintentional shipwrecks. A bit like having a really, really big no parking sign. So let's peel back these ancient layers and shine a light on the architectural prowess that birthed this towering titan of the sea. So let's meet Sostratus of Snidus. I don't know if I'm saying that right. And again, I don't care. We'll go with Sostratus. Not the most familiar name, but trust me, he is the ancient world's Bob the Builder. Sostratus took on the gig of a lifetime, and I would say even an epoch, creating the Lighthouse of Alexandria somewhere around 280 BCE. BCE, if you're not familiar with that, is, is another way of saying BC, and BC is just another way of saying before cheese, which is a greatly contested uh, part of time to where some people believe cheese did exist, but I contest that it's not, or else it wouldn't be called BC. But anyway, first things first, the design. So Stratus wasn't just playing with blocks. He was a visionary, uh, the Steve Jobs of ancient construction. This lighthouse wasn't just tall. It was a three-tiered masterpiece standing over 100 meters tall, like stacking 30 average-sized ancient Greeks on top of each other. It was constructed using limestone, marble, maybe a dash of sandstone for that rustic touch. It was a recipe for architectural success. So Stratus wasn't cheap. He went all out creating a lighthouse that screamed, set your eyes upon me and wonder, I'm illuminating history. But there were no speakers on this lighthouse, so it probably didn't actually say that. They had this ingenious fire and mirror set up at the top, like ancient disco balls sending signals to sailors where the mirror was used in the daytime to reflect the sunlight and a big, huge fire was lit at nighttime and using the mirror as well to direct the light from that fire. So let's talk location, the Pharos Island. 
they didn't just throw a dart at a map. They strategically picked this island because Pharos was the gateway to Alexandria's bustling harbor, making the lighthouse the ultimate bouncer, letting in ships and keeping out trouble. And why all this fuss? Well, it wasn't just a towering ornament for bragging rights. It was the ancient world's GPS, the Google Maps, guiding sailors through the stormy seas, avoiding rocks like a ship avoidance superhero. It wasn't just a light in the dark. It was an original maritime lifesaver. So if we dive into the ancient gossip columns and see what the scrolls have to say about the lighthouse, writers like Strabo and Philo of Byzantium couldn't resist putting their poetic spin on the lighthouse, turning it into the Shakira of antiquity. So Strabo, ancient travel critic or whatever, he stumbles upon the lighthouse of Alexandria and loses his mind. I mean, I get it. It's a tall structure with a flame on top, not exactly a UFO sighting, but Strabo is acting like he just found the lost city of Atlantis in his latte. Philo of Byzantium sees the lighthouse of Alexandria and thinks, this needs a little extra, you know, pizzazz. So according to Philo, it's not just a lighthouse. It's a three-tiered extravaganza. Statues, carvings, the whole shebang. I can almost hear Philo saying, why have a functional lighthouse when you're going to have a dazzling piece of nautical art? Because nothing says safe navigation like dodging statues and intricate carvings in the middle of the night. Let's talk about some controversies, because what's history without a little drama? It makes it kind of fun. It turns out not all the ancient historians were singing kumbaya around this lighthouse campfire. Some had their own versions of fake news about the lighthouse. Take Herostratus, not to be confused with dear Sosostratus. These ancient names are like tongue twisters. Herostratus, the troublemaker, claimed that the lighthouse wasn't designed by Sostratus at all. A little throwing some shade there. The debate continues in the modern era. Historians, archaeologists, and armchair scholars alike have been at each other's throats debating the accuracy of all the ancient descriptions. Some argue that the ancient accounts are as reliable as a chariot with a broken wheel, questioning whether these writers had ever even laid eyes on the lighthouse themselves. As we know with some of the other wonders of the world, these writers had for sure had never seen it, but they had heard of tales and they just made their own descriptions when they were writing their, their history books, or I should say scrolls or texts. Anyway, others, though, defend the ancient scribes, even though we all know that they all know that no one we know has actually seen this thing we know about. Modern interpretations are like remixes of ancient hits. Everyone's got their own spin. Archaeologists armed with shovels and trowels and brushes have uncovered bits and pieces of this ancient puzzle digging along the uh, island of Pharos and continue to bore us with things we really don't care about, like how many permits they had to get, what they ate when they were digging, and what book and TV deals they were getting with their discoveries. And again, no one cares. But the question leaves its mark in our brains. Why make it so extravagant, so large, so expensive, and so ornate? So let's start with the Ptolemaic propaganda machine. These guys knew how to spin a narrative. The Lighthouse of Alexander wasn't just a maritime necessity. It was a PR masterpiece for the Ptolemaic dynasty. Ptolemy Philadelphus, Ptolemy II, whatever you want to say, the guy who sounded like he could use a breath mint, wanted to leave his mark on history. And what better way than a colossal lighthouse? The lighthouse became the jewel in the Ptolemaic crown. Figuratively, they didn't have a crown big enough for that. It symbolized their dominance over the Mediterranean trade and Mediterranean Sea. With the cultural impact, because it wasn't just a brick and mortar structure, it was like the Adele of ancient monuments, influencing art, literature, and shaping the very identity of Alexandria. Artists in ancient Alexandria didn't have an Instagram to flex their creative muscles, so they turned to more traditional mediums. Paintings, sculptures, mosaics, you name it, they lighthoused it. It became the city's unofficial logo, the symbol of maritime might, like a cultural hashtag that said, we're here, we're cultured, and we will be until an earthquake destroys our dreams. In literature, the lighthouse didn't just stand tall, it stood as a metaphor for guidance and enlightenment. Poets and writers could not resist comparing it to a guardian angel for sailors, a celestial lighthouse keeper watching over the stormy seas. And let's not forget the city's identity, because nothing says we're a big deal like having a colossal lighthouse. Alexander wasn't just a port city. It was the city of the lighthouse, a beacon of knowledge, trade, and sophistication. It was the ancient version of saying, we're not like the other cities. We are the city that will light your way. So Ptolemy II, the guy with this 
extremely long name, so I'm just going to stick with Ptolemy II. He's a cunning ruler. He understood the power of a spectacle, and, and what better way to showcase his dominance than a lighthouse that outshone every other structure? I mean, every other structure in the ancient world. Imagine this. Every ship entering Alexandria's harbor would cast its gaze upon this towering statement. It became the city's emblem, a symbol etched onto the soul of Alexandria. You couldn't escape the influence of the lighthouse. It was everywhere. In literature, the lighthouse becomes that metaphorical muse, inspiring poets and storytellers to weave tales of maritime adventures guided by that celestial glow. Not just a structure. It became a character in the epic narrative of Alexandria, that silent guardian watching over the kingdom. And as we sail through these turbulent waters of ancient tales spun by the seafarers and historians who claim to have gazed upon this lighthouse, let's decipher a little bit of the fact from the fiction or as they called it back then, history and myth. Ancient travelers and historians, the unsung bards of antiquity, but were they actually reliable narrators or just ancient storytellers with a penchant for exaggeration? Like take our friend for Strabo, for, for instance, the original travel blogger. He claimed the lighthouse was a technological marvel, that beacon visible from leagues away, guiding sailors like a celestial GPS, but were his eyes as sharp as his description or was just caught up in this ancient hype? Like Philo of Byzantium, another ancient chronicler we mentioned earlier. Flair for the dramatic. According to him, as, as spoken to earlier, the lighthouse was a multi-storied wonder, adorned with statues, intricate carvings, just, it was very gaudy. Now, is this an accurate depiction, or did Philo get a bit too creative with his artistic license? And then there's Herostratus, the troublemaker who claimed Sosistratus, our dear architect, wasn't even the real mastermind, and throwing shade at the origination story of the lighthouse. His account adds a twist of controversy, like this ancient conspiracy theory. So was he a misunderstood whistleblower, or did he just have a personal grudge against the Stratus, or was he just trying to sell books like everybody else? And I also wonder, did he have whistleblower protections if he was a whistleblower, or was he shunned for turning a light into the lighthouse construction conspiracy? Hmm. So comparing the different perspectives, it's like piecing together a mosaic of ancient opinions. Some hailed the lighthouse as navigational marvel. Others might have seen it as nothing more than a glorified bonfire. Uh, we were left with this crazy amount of interpretations. Did it stand as tall and magnificent as Strabo claimed? Was it adorned with statues and carvings? Or was that just Philo's imagination? Was Herostratus a historical whistleblower or just an ancient troll? In the end, deciphering the truth from these ancient accounts is like trying to navigate a, a labyrinth without a map. Challenging, but not entirely impossible. So as we explore the various perspectives, let's appreciate the richness of the ancient storytelling, recognizing that each historian added their brushstroke to this grand canvas of the lighthouse's legacy. But all we really know is what these brushstrokes tell us, as all of us today were living past lives during this time. I don't know about you, but I was an American bison in my past life during the supreme reign of the Grand Lighthouse, and I lived in the Americas and knew nothing about the lighthouse, let alone a really big one on the other side of the world. I didn't know and I didn't care because I was a bison, I think. Maybe not. I don't really remember. Now, let's unfurl the sails of our ancient ship, navigate through the stormy waters of the lighthouse's decline and eventual demise. Spoiler alert, it's not a tale of glory, but rather a tragic chapter in, uh, in antiquity. The decline of the lighthouse was not a sudden storm, but a gradual erosion, much like the waves that lapped at its foundations. Historical events conspired against this once majestic structure, contributing to its slow descent into obscurity. For almost 1,500 years, it stood sentinel, weathering the waves, the storms, the wind, sea spray, multiple earthquakes. However, it was finally and permanently destroyed in the early 15th century. The details are a bit murky, like an ancient fog, but various accounts suggest a fateful series of events that led to the collapse or the dismantling of the lighthouse. One theory suggests that a series of earthquakes, possibly coupled with tsunamis, delivered the final blow. The foundations, weakened over time, could not withstand the relentless onslaught of nature's fury. Another theory, perhaps more traumatic, involves human intervention. Some ancient accounts propose that during the medieval period, stones from the lighthouse were repurposed for the construction of a fortress that stands on the island today. But the truth is, the two-theory theory is the theory that is most accurately depicting an accurate theory about what happened to the lighthouse. Meaning, the first theory is true, and the second theory is true. 
There was a lot of destruction naturally caused over the 1500 years of the lighthouse's existence. And people did take materials from the lighthouse to build the fortress that now stands at the island. Now, the consequences of the lighthouse's demise were felt far beyond its crumbling stones. It wasn't just a loss of navigational aid. It was the end of an era. This cultural icon swallowed by the waves of time and by, well, a new fortress. So as we sail away from the wreckage of the island of Pharos, let's remember it's not just a fallen tower, but a testament to the impermanence of even the grandest monuments. The lighthouse of Alexandria may have dimmed, but its flickering legacy continues to eliminate the pages of history. Ah, the modern age where archaeologists are the new treasure hunters and historians wield the mighty power of hindsight. Let's set our compass to the present and explore the contemporary endeavors to unravel the mysteries that remain about the lighthouse. The scholars have turned their gaze to the underwater realms around the ancient island of Pharos, where the lighthouse once stood tall. Submerged fragments and artifacts are like breadcrumbs, leading them back to the grand structure that once graced the shores. And the debates, oh, they're like a modern-day chariot race of opinions. Some scholars argue that the remnants discovered are indeed part of the lighthouse, while others raise their metaphorical eyebrows, questioning if we're just seeing shapes in the water. Now, they pretty much all agree. The technology of today, my dear viewers, has become the modern-day philosopher's stone. Ground-penetrating radar, sonar, and all sorts of high-tech wizardry that is deployed to map the hidden landscapes beneath the earth and sea. But of course, with progress, there does come this controversy. Debates that rival the intellectual arena of ancient scholars. Some question the very existence of the lighthouse. Others engage in a virtual chariot race of reconstructions, attempting to visualize the appearance of the lighthouse based on the fragments and historical descriptions and little AI tools that I found to be able to use for this episode. The debates extend to every aspect from its height to its architectural intricacies. Was it adorned with statues and carvings or was it more a utilitarian structure? This clash of opinions echoes through the digital corridors of academia. So, dear viewers, as we navigate the currents of modern investigations, let's appreciate the scholars and scientists who continue to unravel the mysteries. The debates may be heated, the controversies may linger, but the quest for understanding keeps the flame of curiosity burning bright, like the lighthouse, that the quest of understanding is questing to understand. You know, if only the ancient world had UN peacekeepers, maybe they could have brokered a truce between the earthquakes and the poor lighthouse. What if aliens visited ancient Alexandria? Imagine little green beings examining the lighthouse, wondering if it was an ancient Martian beacon. Maybe the pharaohs were intergalactic tour guides, and the lighthouse was their version of a universal welcome sign. With the recent uptick in UFO sightings by crazy people, and the recent uptick in UAP sightings by totally normal people, we must wonder. Ancient aliens? Ah, the lighthouse of Alexandria transcends ancient bricks and flame. It's not merely a navigational aid, but a regal symbol of Ptolemaic prowess. Beyond its practicality, it was the share of ancient monuments, influencing art, literature, and shaping Alexandria's identity. To people who care, it's more than a structure. It's a cultural icon, a celestial proclamation of maritime might. All right, you lot. You've enjoyed this historical roller coaster, and even if you haven't, I won't judge, hit that like button. It's like giving a little pat on the back to history. And hey, if you subscribe, you'll get a virtual high five from yours truly. Now, I'm not saying bad things will happen if you don't like or subscribe, but rumor has it the ghost of Ptolemy II might rearrange your sock drawer. Yeah, a spectral sock enthusiast. Terrifying, I know. So to save your socks from a paranormal ordeal, just click those buttons. It's like a sock insurance policy, but weirder. Cheers. I love you all.